Okay, so first of the little applications of our integration, apart from our area and um, area between curves, is really, I guess, the average value of a function. Now, let's not be confused with average rate of change, okay? So we've got two average terms, if you like. Y2 minus Y1, X2 minus X1, average rate of change, okay? So obviously our, our gradient between two points. The average value of the function is exactly that. It's the value that the function takes on average over the course of the interval we're talking about. So if we can have a look at this one just here on the right, obviously the value of the function starts there. It finishes up here at B. Now, what are the values in between? Well, that average value um, relates to the area under the curve. All right, so formally, the average value of the function over the interval a to b is simply given by the integral from v to a of f of x dx multiplied by 1 over b minus a. So as long as you identify the right rule to use, it's actually quite a straightforward function, okay? So average value of the function between those, let's have a look. So the average value is 1 over b minus a which is 1 over 3 minus 1, integral between 1 and 3 of x squared minus x dx, which is equal to uh, a half at the front of x to the 3 on 3 minus x to the 2 on 2, between 3 and 1, which is equal to a half outside of, we'll go, 27 on 3 minus 9 on 2, subtract 1 on 3 minus 1 on 2. Oh, what's that equal to? That's a half of, um, well, we know it's 9. Let's make it all in sixes so it's a bit easier. Eh? So we get 227 is 54 minus 27. Now, on 6, so that's going to be minus 2 on 6. Minus a minus is a plus, plus 3 on 6, uh, which is equal to negative 29, 57 minus 29. What's that? 28. So we get 28 on 6 times a half, which is 14 on 6 which is 7 on 3. So that's the average value of the function. Does that seem reasonable? Well, at x equal to 1, my function is 0. At x equal to 3, my function is 6. So somewhere between those two values is reasonable. And so that's, that's quite feasible. Let's go to the second one. Interval between 0 and pi. So it's 1 over b minus a between 0 and b of sine 2x dx, 1 over pi. What's the antiderivative of sine? It's negative, isn't it? 1 half cos 2x between pi and 0. So in this case, I might bring the negative half out the front. 1 over 2 pi outside of cos of 2 pi minus cos of 0. Negative 1 on 2 pi outside of cos of 2 pi is 1, cos of 0 is 1, so we get 0. So how does that match off to our graph? Well, sine 2x looks a bit like that. Uh, the period is 2 pi on 2, which is pi. So that's pi there. That's pi on 2. And so it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? That area there will cancel out with this area there. So the average value of that graph happens to be 0. All right. um, and don't forget also in our, with our trig, that line there, yeah, that's the mid, middle, if you like. Um, 
not the amplitude, is the average value. We call it the mean, don't we? The mean line. So it all it all ties in. All right, so a couple more. We spoke in our differentiation about the relationship between um, acceleration, velocity, and position. And that is the acceleration is the rate of change of our velocity. And our velocity is the rate of change of our position. Which means if I integrate those respective derivatives, I get back from position to velocity to acceleration. Um, and acceleration through to velocity through to position. All right? So average velocity, y2 minus y1. Okay, so there's my average velocity, not the average value of the function. Change in position over change in time. Uh, instantaneous velocity, we've spoken about previously. The gradient at a point. So, what have we got here? The position given by a particle on a straight line. Uh, is given by, so there's x, there's t. If I sketch this graph, uh, intercepts are at 0 and 2. And so there's my um, x of t graph, and I reckon that's going to be at the point 2 at 0. We know from symmetry that there is going to be the point one something, put one in, one squared minus two is one negative one. All right, so that's what my position looks like. The initial position of the particle, initial anything is x of zero, so which is just equal to zero. So my position particle starts at, um, if we're referencing any point, no, just that the origin will do. After two seconds, um, I say this 2 squared minus 4, which is equal to 0 again. So after 2 seconds, theoretically, we haven't moved anywhere, okay? So that means the displacement after 2 seconds is equal to 0, as opposed to the distance we've travelled. So you can see, hopefully, in the first second... I go down to negative one, and in the second second, I come back up to zero. So in actual fact, the distance traveled is two meters, but my displacement is zero. Okay, instantaneous, instantaneous velocity of our particle, which is dx dt, and that's given by 2t minus two. So that's my velocity at any point in time, okay? When and where is the particle at rest? So if I solve, we can see from the graph, after one second, my particle is at rest. And at t equal to one, the particle is equal to negative one. So we'll say it's at rest at one second, where it is one metre left of origin. The distance travelled by the particle in the first two seconds, well, we've just spoken about that, haven't we? Okay. Um, so we can see from our graph, we were one second down, one second up. So at t equal to two, we've travelled two meters now another way we can consider that if i sketch my velocity time graph which is uh, what is it 2t minus 2 so we start at negative 2 and we've got a gradient of positive 2 and we just said the velocity was 0 1 minus 2 after two seconds, um, a 
after two seconds, where am I? I'm at two. So the area under the curve, so something worth noting, area under velocity time graph is, um, it can be our displacement can also be a distance traveled. Now, obviously, if we consider the area here, so we could work out our antiderivatives, but given we've just got triangles, I won't worry about that. That area there is a half base height, which is a half one by two, which is one, if you like, meter squared. And that one is negative a half times base times height, which is negative one meter squared. So if I add these two together, I get zero, which is my displacement. But if we get the signed area, which means just take the positive of everything, I get one plus one, which is two meters, which is the um, distance I've traveled there. So displacement, just evaluate. And the distance travelled, I've got to have the signed. All right. Last one, acceleration of the particle. So acceleration A is equal to dV dt, which is equal to 2 metres per second squared. Um, I think that's it, is it? Yep. Must be me. Okay, so let's have a bit of a look here. We need to find the F inverse function and the function. So let's have a quick check of the inverse first. So to find the inverse, let's swap the X and the Y. Natural log of Y plus 1. So E to the X equals Y plus 1. So Y is equal to E to the X minus 1. So we don't leave it in that form. F inverse is equal to E to the X minus 1. So if we do a quick graph sketch in blue, um, we know my e to the x graph looks a little, it's a bit that way, isn't it? We're only sketching from the positive domain at x equal to zero, e to zero is one, so it comes in through here. Uh, my log function is going to be similar in that um, it shifted one unit to the left, so the asymptote will be at negative one. At x equal to zero, I get natural log of one, which is zero. So it's going to look a little bit like that. Yeah. So what I might do is let's just add a graph to give me a more accurate, a more accurate look at it. Hey, hang on. Let's get it straight. That looks a bit better. Okay, so there's our graph, or our graphs. All right, find the exact value of the area between zero and natural log two of f inverse of x. So f inverse of x is our way to the x graph. So we're looking at something like, I don't know, that area there, yeah? So if we work that out, integral between 0 natural log 2 of f inverse, which is e to the x minus 1 dx, which is equal to e to the x minus x between 0 and natural log of 2, which is equal to e to the natural log of 2 minus natural log of 2 in brackets e to the 0 minus 0. Um, probably shouldn't work across like this. E, now, e to the natural log 2, e log base e are the same, so that just is equal to 2 minus natural log of 2 minus e to the 0 is 1 minus 0. So we just get 1 minus natural log of 2. 
So that's that area there. Yeah. Um, part two, I may look in black because it wants the exact value between zero and one of f of x. So zero, one, I don't know, maybe that's, maybe that's that area there. So what we're looking for is the integral between zero and one of natural log x plus one dx. Now you'll remember, we don't have an antiderivative for the natural log. So what does that mean here for us? And let's think about, clearly we've been asked to find that other area. So let's, let's look at some points here. If I put x equal to one, in my graph between zero and one, what do I get? I get natural log of one plus one, which is the point one, natural log two. Probably should have done that in black. If I compare that to up here, well, because it's the inverse, that must be the point natural log two of one. So the area I'm looking for here in black, so this shape here, that's what we're after. Yeah, can we see that? That's the same area here. Because that's the point uh, zero natural log two. That's the same as that area there in green. So I need that green area. So the green area is simply that rectangle, which I'll uh, let's go back one. Green area is this rectangle here. Subtract that red area that we've worked out. And that gives me the grain. So what's the area of that rectangle? Well, its dimensions are one across and log two up. So it's log two by one. So that makes it natural log of two minus um, that triangle area in red, which is one minus natural log of two. So what does that give me? That gives me one minus in bracket, one minus natural log of two which is one minus one, which is zero, minus a minus is a plus, which gives me natural log of two as a final answer. So look, a little bit challenging. Um, I guess in reality, we might expect a little bit more direction perhaps, like a little hence in here somewhere, hence find the exact area. But um, yeah, it's just making use of the knowledge of our, our inverse functions. Okay, all right, last one. Population of a kangaroo, of kangaroos on island is increasing a rate given by, there's no rate of increase. Find the rate of growth. Um, when t equals zero, t equals five and t equals 26. So what is the rate? So we need P of zero, which is equal to eight, natural log one, now natural log of one is zero, which is zero. P of five, which is eight natural log of six. And P 26.5, which is eight natural log 27.5. Sketch the graph of P of T. So it's a log function. We're not going to be interested in a negative population. So we know it's moved one unit to the left and from our P of zero, zero, we know it's there. And so we know our graph looks a little bit like that in some way, shape or form, yeah? We'll put the point zero, zero, P 
of t t. Determine the inverse function. Similar, so let's go uh, x is equal to 8 natural log of um, uh, well, actually, we better go. Let's undo that a bit. We we'll use the variables there, so we'll go. Um, t is equal to eight natural log of p plus one. So t on eight is equal to natural log of p plus one. E to the t on eight minus one equals p. So p inverse is equal to e to the 1 eighth t minus 1. So if I now give a quick sketch of that graph, which we might do in blue, um, 0, 0, because of that 1 eighth factor, we sort of end up with something a little bit like that. So let's just put in a, a, um, put in a CAS snapshot. So we can see there, I'll just tidy this up a fraction, um, that our graph looks a little bit like that. And I put our point of intersection in, okay? And notice our point of intersection is one of those coordinates that we were looking at. So there's a scratch, determine the inverse function. Use this inverse to assist in finding the area under the graph of PET between zero and 26.5. So even if I use this one, the area that I'm looking for under the graph of P of T, which is the log function, is that area there. Yeah? Now, if I concentrate a little bit more, that area there, oh, let's grab this one. That area there is actually that square less that section, isn't it? And as we experienced in our previous example, I might use yellow, that section is that bit here. And I can work out that bit because that's an exponential graph. I can't work out the integral of natural log x plus one because um, I haven't got any derivative. So if we just sort of spell that out a bit, I need the integral between zero and 26.5 of a natural log of t plus one. So I wanna get the integral uh, same limits, 0, 26.5 of e to the 1 eighth x minus 1. Actually, I should put a t, shouldn't I? dt, which is equal to 1 on k. So I get 8e to the 1 eighth t minus t between 26.5 and 0. Yeah, so now if we evaluate a few of those things, let's have a look. So if I evaluate this integral here, between zero and 26.5 of f of two of x, which is our function up there in red, I get 185.129. So the rectangle that gets created in here, or the square as it turns out, is just a 26.5 by 26.5 rectangle or square. Um, and if I subtract the 185 from that, as I have here, I'll get 517.121. So that actually gives me the area that we're interested in. Uh, therefore, uh, the area is equal, that's a bad spelling, area is equal to 517.12. Uh, now, if we compare that just to going to the integral and working out between 0 and 26.5 of f1 of x, which is the log function, which our calculator can evaluate, we get that 517. So I'm comfortable with that being the area. 
What does this area represent? Well, don't forget that the graph itself or the curve itself is a rate of change. So P of T is a rate. Um, in the same way that velocity time is a rate. Yeah, that velocity is a rate. Now, we just spoke earlier that the area under a velocity time graph is the distance travelled, which means the area under the graph is the... Um, in the way that distance is the rate of change of the velocity, well, my P of T is the rate of change of my population. So in actual fact, the area under the curve is the population of my kangaroos. So that's the population of the kangaroos at t equal to 26.5, which is 517.12. Okay, so it's just, you can see here how we can tie in our knowledge of um, area under curves, integration, functions and inverse functions and, and the relationship they have with each other. Um, yeah, so look, have a good go through that chapter 11. And um, yeah, when you get those done, have a look at those end of chapter questions.